COVID-19 and its impact on mental health. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. The coronavirus pandemic has killed millions across the globe, including more than one million right here in the United States. And while the loss of loved ones has been devastating for families, the fallout has also left huge numbers struggling with mental health issues. Depression and anxiety have skyrocketed as people have tried to cope with the impact of COVID-19 for more than two years now. And during this program, you will hear some of those stories. Joining us right now from New York is Dr. Andrew Schwimm. He's a licensed clinical psychologist. With us, too, from Philadelphia is Ann Rosen Spector. She is a clinical psychologist in private practice. And also with us is CGTN America digital reporter Gabriel Yin Yue. I want to welcome all of you to the show. And Gabriel, before we get to the medical professionals, I'd like to start with you because you've had this opportunity to travel around and actually talk to people who are grappling with mental health issues. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this process and what you've learned in your travels? Yes, of course, Mike. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, it's been a very um, difficult journey emotionally, but I'm also so grateful that these people decided to you know, share their stories on international TV. Um, I started to work on this project because there was one day that I watched on the news and people say that, oh, we can now go back to normal. And I found myself wondering, you know, what does normal feel like? It feels a little bit foreign even. Uh, but then, you know, the following piece was about COVID deaths totally in the States reaching more than a million. And I found myself thinking, like, how can those people, you know, go back to normal? What is normal for them? But I think I only realized the magnitude of this issue when I actually did the research, that there are just so many heartbreaking stories online about people who struggle to move on after they've lo lost their loved one, after they've lost um, the financial income, or, or, or a lot of tragic stories. And I found that these stories are open and told on uh, you know, public media. So I thought that you know, it would be great if we could just get their voices out there. Um, but also, before I actually interviewed them, I had to seek a therapist myself to ask about, you know, how can I talk to these people? What are the better ways to ask them these questions? Because I wouldn't want to trigger any difficult emotions during the interview. And only then I learned that there are just so many things that the society are, is unaware of. For example, you, you, you can't, you, uh, you're, you better use like passive tones to address um, suicide issues. Don't say someone killed themselves, say someone took their own life so that you can you know, sound more um, gentle. So there are a lot of things that I think as a journalist while reporting, I felt like I had to know, but now I also feel like the more people know about it, the better for these people. Yeah, and we're going to start by rolling a piece about a, a young family grappling with the loss of a father and, and a husband. A uh, very powerful story. Let's take a look. Unicorns can mean the world to a four-year-old girl like Elsie. Two years ago, Elsie celebrated her birthday with her dad, Martin. They made a cake decorated with unicorn sprinkles. It was a happy, happy birthday, but it was also the last that they'd celebrate together before Martin died from COVID-19. This year, when Elsie asked for another unicorn-themed birthday just like two years ago, her mother Pamela Edison suddenly understood that it was Elsie's way of channeling her grief, trying to rewind life back to a time when her father was still around. Unicorns really can't mean the world to Elsie after he died, like, it's just like everything kind of stopped. I told Elsie, you know, Papa got very sick, the, he went to the hospital, the doctors tried to fix him, but it, it didn't work and he's not coming back, he's up in heaven. And then, you know, at that point, she got very, she was very sad. So, um, and I like was very not equipped to figure out how to help her. Pamela had to find a specialized therapist to help Elsie and her younger brother properly deal with their grief, a process that took about a year. Finding the help can be surprisingly challenging. What I was hearing was a lot of therapists weren't understanding the grief that they were experiencing. And I've been told that sometimes therapists take like not a lot of courses in grief, so they don't really know grief. So. 
some, some of them had trouble finding that person that they could really talk to. On the other side of the picture, psychologists say that burnout in their profession is nothing but common. If they're not already burnt out or like kind of teetering on, nobody has openings. It's really hard to find mental health providers who have openings, and so there are a lot of folks who are tired. Data show that the COVID toll here in the U.S. include more than 215,000 children who suffered the loss of at least one parent or caregiver. Yet there are severe shortages of mental health professionals here in the United States. According to research back in 2018, in urban areas, for every 100,000 people, there are only about 33 psychologists. And in rural areas, it's even worse. Gabriel, uh, Pamela says in your piece, after he died, it just felt like everything stopped. And she talks about she wasn't equipped to, to deal with uh, helping her kids get through this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the first question that I asked her was, you know, when it happened, as an adult, it was already hard to process that. But her daughter back then was about, what, like two years old, or even like her son was even younger, that, you know, how can she just explain to them that they don't have father anymore like how can the kids at that age understand that and, and i felt myself completely lost in that question and really wanted to hear how she did it but she was lost too and obviously that it's it's, it's a difficult question and it's obviously not a question that people think about on a daily basis but i think the lack of thinking of it is what is like one of the problems that this interview really revealed and obviously it was very hard what she did was just to tell the truth and Later in the interview, she did say that one of the therapists actually gave her like a child-friendly version of explanation to death uh, with very cute languages, but, you know, trying to soften this hard truth. But it wasn't something that, you know, everybody was automatically using. And just like she said in the interview, there were lots of parents worrying about how their kids was going to cope with the grief but didn't get the help that it needed. You know, Anne, let me ask you about this. Uh, you know, you, you hear a mom talking about how just everything stopped. I mean, she's lost her husband, and yet she's got to deal with her kids and their grief, and how does she get them through that? But, but you also get the sense that she's probably not also focused on her own mental health needs. Can you talk about that whole dynamic? Well, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, part of what it is now is that we've separated death from the rest of life, you know. Remember, life expectancy used to be much shorter. People lived in rural areas. People saw death all the time, but we don't see it that much anymore. And it usually happens, and children don't go to funerals. Children don't visit people in hospital. Obviously, they can't do that with COVID. But part of it is that death doesn't really make any sense to anybody. How can something be and then never be? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And when the mother is grieving over being a single mother, She's not, surprisingly, less emotionally available to her children because she has her own grief. Yeah. Andrew, let me talk to you about another thing that came up in, in Gabriel's report, which is, of course, uh, burnout for people in your profession. And I, and I remember, uh, you know, when you think about the pandemic, uh, you're in New York. It was the epicenter at the very beginning. I remember talking to a therapist just a few months ago who said, you know, he'd work with his, you know, his patients throughout the day, go home at night, lie down on the bed. All he heard were ambulance sirens. All he could think was, there's another person that's probably going to the hospital that's not coming home. That's another family I'm probably going to have to talk to. This is a therapist who also dealt with a lot of patients after 9-11. Um, can you talk about burnout and the difficulty of, of doing the job that you do during these trying times? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I live right by a couple of hospitals too. It's the same exact same, it was the same exact same thing for me. Um, it's hard because it's constantly on your mind. And I think at the start of the pandemic, we as mental health professionals really kind of jumped in and said, how can we help? How can we help? Not knowing how long this was going to last. And I think like many medical professionals, we kind of went all in at the beginning. And all of a sudden, we're kind of here two, two and a half years later, still dealing with some of the same things. And you can imagine if you get, you know, it's become a marathon, not a sprint. And a lot of us sprinted out to go. And so it's made it a lot harder here on the back end where you're seeing a lot of mental health professionals who are starting to deal with their own forms of, of uh, issues related to stress, anxiety, depression, just because of all the weight that they've had to carry, the grief that they've had to carry throughout this for their clients.
I'd like to also invite into the discussion uh, from Miami, Jonathan Comer. He's a professor of psychology at Florida International University. And, and Jonathan, uh, you know, we're talking about therapists and the difficulties uh, of that job, but we're also seeing a lot of people on the front lines. Uh, these doctors and nurses who worked in the COVID wings, who, who actually had to help these patients who came in, had to talk to the families because the families couldn't be there, had to break the news that, that the patients were dying, um, going through a lot of that. And I remember talking to a nurse who worked in a COVID ring wing and, and asking her, you know, are, are you suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder? And she said, probably, but I certainly don't have time to go see a therapist right now. I've, I've got a job that demands that I'm there and present. I'll go and see one after the pandemic. But what we're seeing now is a lot of those people are just chucking the careers. I mean, it, it, the burnout, can you talk to us about that and the difficulties of, of actually having to be on the front lines? Yeah, you know, the burnout on the front lines, uh, you know, burnout to say the least, but also, as you're saying, uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms, even post-traumatic stress disorder, rates of depression, anxiety among first responders and other people on the front lines, um, you know, it's been quite a quite a steep increase uh, in the rate. So it's, it's very concerning. We always uh, talk about, you know, so when you get on the airplane, they say, you know, in the event of an emergency, make sure you put your own mask on before you... Uh, uh, assist others, and um, you know that's that's very true for for responders, medical responders, therapists. Uh, it's um, you know we 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 all need to be thinking about how we're taking care of ourselves so we can take care of each other. And you're there at a university, and, and we're seeing a lot of problems with young people as well. They have to deal with so much right now. Of course, we've had these school shootings in the news, um, and then along comes COVID. The levels of anxiety, uh, depression seem to be skyrocketing. Um, can you talk to us about that? Because young people generally, they, they're not thinking about their own mortality, but now I think they're, they're kind of faced with it. Yeah, yeah, these are incredibly uh, heavy times uh, for young people. I think, you know, the word unprecedented get throws, gets thrown around a lot, um, but these are unprecedented times. The number of crises uh, on top of one another is, um, is really staggering. And, uh, you know, the, the young people we're working with, whether children, adolescents, young adults, um, the, the, as you're saying, the uh, sort of problems of despair, of resignation, of depression, of grief, um, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing very high rates. Let's take another look at uh, one of Gabriel's pieces. This is uh, also about the death of a loved one. It's a sister uh, talking about the tragedy of her brother dying. Let's take a look. That's one thing I can't get over is I wish I had hugged him. The void of losing her brother can never be filled. For as long as I possibly could. When Jennifer Hayen's brother passed away from COVID-19, the sadness nearly took her away too. When I woke up in the morning, I just didn't want to wake up. You know, I, I wish I just would just pass in my sleep or um, if I was driving, someone would just hit me. Through difficult therapy sessions that forced her to deal with her feelings, Jennifer was finally able to manage her grief. But she's still angry at the way government officials manage the pandemic. My anger lies towards misinformation and towards our, our leadership, that they put economy over the people. And they were just in enforcing people to go back to work when a lot of us were doing fine working from home. Some people who've been through grief therapy told us that one of the most valuable things they learned from the process was to directly face their grief instead of hiding it or simply waiting for it to be gone. But they also mentioned that the lack of public discussion about death or even some sort of taboo around this topic will only make it harder for the society to truly heal from the pandemic. But now that they've managed their own grief, they also want to start helping others to truly start healing. I first met Jennifer in a local cafe where there was a wall of yellow heart-shaped stickers to remember COVID victims. She also volunteered in local memorial projects and vaccination campaigns. And this is how she came out from her grief. And the only way we can find ourselves is through helping others. And I think that that's the best part of, of this journey is that you, you do find that you're honoring your loved one by helping others. And Gabriel, I noticed uh, that that seemed to be the connective tissue through all of your pieces with it. Each one of these people found some sort of purpose and meaning in trying to help others after going through this enormous grief. Yeah, and it was very surprising to see because 
um, like during the interview with Jennifer, there were multiple times that I was like, should I stop the interview? Because the, you know, the advice that I got from the therapist in doing this interview is that you have to be very candid, you have to be very honest and no surprising question. I always ask them that if you don't feel like you want to answer this, just don't. Um, so there were multiple times when Jennifer was telling me about the pain that she felt after losing her brother, I was like, you know, I could feel that the emotion was still very strong. So when she said that what she got from dealing with this grief is actually to help other people, I was like not, not expecting this twist. Um, and just like you said, in all of these um, interviewees, they said that it was through helping others that they found a reason or they found the meaning to, to just keep going. And I think that's the most beautiful thing in, in this um, experience for them. Of course, I'm not trying to be romantic about tragedy. There's nothing about that. But it's just so surprising to see that these people lost their loved ones, but love is still the answer for them. And Anne, can you talk to us a little bit about this? Is this part of the healing process, is trying to find some sense of purpose or, or some sort of meaning through the loss of a loved one? think so because you know we are a social being and so one of the things that happened during the pandemic whether you're talking about people who lost people or kids who couldn't go to school is that they were very isolated from their community and so anything that you do in a pro-social way to bond with other people makes you feel more of the social fabric and and makes you feel more part of the world and that's been a big problem during the pandemic that people didn't have you couldn't give somebody a hug. You know, you go to a funeral, everybody hugs, everybody cries. We didn't have that. Yeah, Andrew, talk about that because uh, it, it's it's not just the funerals. I mean, it's the, the sense, you know, as I mentioned, talking to this nurse, you, you can't say goodbye to a loved one. You can't see them and, and, and have that closure. And then again, as she pointed out, in many cases, the funerals had to be postponed. You couldn't be around people. Um, these rituals are really important in part of the healing process, correct? Yeah, they definitely are, especially when you look at the, how various religions handle the, the burial process. It, it varies from, you know, culture to culture. And, and when, when you're not able to be around people or have to do it via Zoom or something like that, there's just a lack of that community in grieving. Um, like, I'm from New Orleans, and I know a really big part of the grieving process is to throw a party. Um, it's part of, like, how you celebrate the life of the loved one. And you're not able to do that in person. It makes it really tough on everybody out there. There is a lack of closure. And Jonathan, uh, this young woman in the story, Jennifer Hayes, uh, very open about what she's gone through and what she's still going through. Young people grappling with so much. We're seeing spikes in depression, anxiety among young people. Uh, there was a piece earlier this year about how COVID-19 has sparked a, a mental health crisis on college campuses nationwide. Can you talk just anecdotally about what you're seeing on your campus and, and what are universities doing to try and deal with that? Because you know, the isolation issue, you're separated from your families and in many cases, you're not in the classroom where you can bond with friends, you're doing it remotely, although now people are going back into the classrooms, but they had to go through that whole period. Yeah, yeah. The isolation has been among uh, the hardest for, for young people to cope with. Uh, you know, it's a very um, exciting time, uh, young adulthood, but it's also a very vulnerable time. And there's so much transformation and, and um, there's such a need for social cohesion. So uh, the fact that um, so many students have been um, uh, isolated and, and not together has been a major part of this. And I, I couldn't agree more that, that, you know, being around people is going to be the best way to get through this going forward to the extent that we met it, that we can. Andrew, you spoke with one of my colleagues back in 2020 about 18 to 24 year olds uh, being impacted by COVID and a survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention revealed that one in four, that's one in four people between that age group considered suicide in June of 2020. Those are really alarming numbers. I'm sure if parents are watching right now, what would your advice be to them? And what about kids who are, are thinking that way, uh, you know, in terms of seeking help? The first thing is normalization. It's not uncommon to have those sort of thoughts. And it's okay. It's our brain's way of telling us that something's going on. And so we want to actually encourage, I mean, I, I would want to encourage those people to actually talk about it um, and to encourage parents to talk to their 
children about that and whether they're having any of those sort of thoughts. I think it's easy to think that, we, I think a lot of people want to dance around that sort of, because it's such a taboo topic. I think it can be easy sometimes to just say like, oh, if I talk to this person about it, then that's going to force them to want to do it or it's going to put an idea in their head. But that's actually not the case. A lot of research backs up that that's not the case. And so it's really important for us to kind of make it less taboo and to talk about it even more and to talk about what are the things that we can do to help people who are experiencing those types of thoughts. And uh, it, it's not just young people. Uh, we saw spikes in suicide rates uh, during the 1880 and 1918 uh, flu pandemics. There were concerns we might see the same thing uh, this time around, but there was a survey done in Maryland and they actually looked, uh, this was in 2020, they analyzed suicides in the state and they were kind of surprised at the results. Uh, suicides went down uh, when compared to previous three years. But then the, uh, the people conducting the study actually dug a little bit deeper and what they found was that it, they went down dramatically uh, among white uh, respondents. But when it came to black residents, the numbers actually jumped by 94% during that same time frame. And this gets to another issue, which is vulnerable populations. Uh, I mean, what the researchers found is that of course, you know, they were vulnerable in the sense that there were a lot more infections within this community. Uh, they were in high risk jobs in many cases. There were more deaths. They were also dealing with the economic hardships uh, of the pandemic. Can you talk to us about access? I mean, obviously you've got a lot of patients, but there are some people who really struggle in terms of getting access to mental health, even though they may need it. I think that everybody knows that there isn't sufficient access throughout the country and throughout all different groups. I mean, we, you know, people are leaving the profession in droves. Uh, insurance companies uh, pay for some of it. Publicly funded uh, care facilities are, you know, shrinking. It's very hard. And you, we know that among certain populations, certainly among African American and Latinas in this country, their access to health care is much less robust and less open. I speak Spanish, but I am not bilingual Spanish. And I get at least one or two calls a week from somebody who needs a Spanish speaker. And I can't do that. I can help translate, but I cannot speak bilingually. And there aren't just enough people to help them in that situation. And when you add you know, illness and everybody is dying around you and your job is stressful and you can't not go to work and there's no one to watch your kids and you don't have Wi-Fi and you can't do Zoom school. It's a lot of pressure. Andrew, talk about that. Um, you know, you, you have people in your profession who are leaving in droves. Uh, were there t days when you just said, man, I want to hang it up? Because it is a tough profession. And, and what do you do when you have those days where you've just been inundated uh, talking to people who are going through so much how do you kind of unwind and, and uh, how much time do you spend with a therapist? Um, you know, I've, I've spent a few years with my own therapist and it's incredibly helpful for me to have a space to talk to somebody else. And I, you know, a lot of my colleagues have the same thing. Um, I would say that I, I'd be lying if I said I haven't ever had those sort of thoughts of like, is it, you know, is, is enough enough? Um, a lot of my background comes from doing trauma work, grief work. And, and so like, there are definitely days where I've, come home and said, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And I've found ways to kind of lessen my caseload a little bit, um, to take on other jobs that make, that kind of give me a lot of joy. And then I have my own, you know, things at home that I do to take care of myself, like running. And I have a dog that's upstairs right now, um, that I can't wait to see after this. And, uh, you know, I, I try to do little things here and there to take care of myself. Uh, but it's definitely not easy. It, it weighs, it weighs heavy. Jonathan, let me ask you, I mentioned uh, this nurse that I spoke to who said, you know, maybe I'll go see a therapist after the pandemic's over, and we don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, it seems like it just keeps lingering. But if she, you know, she's in the medical profession, if she broke her arm, she wouldn't say, you know, I'm going to wait until after the pandemic and go get a doctor to set my arm. There's this kind of belief that you can kind of put your mental health on the back burner. And there's also a stigma attached with this as well. Can you talk about that? And where does this country need to go? and for that matter, the rest of the world, in terms of embracing the fact that mental health is an important issue. Yeah, yeah, mental health is physical health. Mental health is health. Um, and, uh, you know, this is definitely, stigma-related concerns are a, a major issue with, with um, you know, there's problems with treatment access, but there's also problems with uh, treatment acceptability for a lot of people. And, you know, the most important thing, if uh, we tell people, if you're not ready to talk to a therapist, Talk to talk to clergy. Talk to your friends. Um, you want to start talking, um, and then you know, hopefully, there there are, you know options. There are uh, 
There are computer programs that can help for people that are not ready for that sort of higher level of care. Um, it, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. There are a lot of mental health supports and resources. And of course, um, you know, friends can be naturally therapeutic and, um, you know, just being around people. So, you know, even if you can't uh, go all the way in the water, you know, if, you know, putting a toe in or, you know, just talking to someone or, or, or um, you know, uh, or, or looking into other resources online or, or at the bookstore can be can be helpful, too, if nothing else. And I want to get your thoughts about something that Gabriel said when we started this conversation, which is that he went and talked to a therapist before he went out to do these interviews. And, and that's important, isn't it? Because you can, can actually do a lot more harm in the way you question people after something like this in terms of mental health. Uh, can you talk to us about the importance of, of taking that step on his part? I think it's incredibly important. I mean, when I talk to people, and of course, it's not just with COVID. I've dealt many times with people who have lost a child to suicide or to illness or through accidents. And the way people talk to them makes them defensive. And so really, it's talking, and I think he said it very well, it's really listening and giving people permission to not talk or to talk a lot and to let them lead the story. Uh, what most people report is when somebody says something to them like, well, call me if you need anything. That's not helpful to people because it puts the burden back on the bereaved. It's better to say, I'm going to come by, I'm going to take you for a walk. You know, do you want me to sit with you? Do you want me to do something? Do some of the work for them. But I think it's very important that we learn how to listen and pay attention to the very subtle clues that people are giving us. Andrew, uh, let's talk a little bit about long COVID. We're just about out of time, but this, this long arc of uh, mental health issues, we're going to have to be dealing with it for some time. You know, one of the things I've, I've talked to people who have long COVID, you know, and this, this debilitating quality that you've got brain fog and all these issues, and a lot of these people are young. Um, it's really incredibly depressing, and it looks like it could be long term. Can you talk to us about that? And, and should there be more money placed into efforts to try and deal with that? I mean, the answer to that is always yes. There should always be more money that go into work towards uh, medical and mental health. Um, but, but it, yeah, I mean, it's something that's coming up, and I think that's that's a big fear of a lot of my friends right now. Is if I get COVID and, and it lingers just a little bit, it's like, well, how long is this going to last, and what are the long-term effects of this? And that can cause a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. Um, and so, I think it's really important for us to kind of understand a little bit more of what that means long-term, and and uh, eventually kind of work our way toward seeing how we can help those people who are dealing with that. But it is something that's going to be very scary down the line. Gabriel, I want to thank you for providing the stories that gave us a launching pad to talk about this really important topic. And I want to thank our panelists for uh, giving us your insights. Really appreciate it. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Thanks so much for watching. Please join us again next time. of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference.